The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Let me share my screen. Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar called uh, Extending Petrel with Python for Geology, Geophysics, Reservoir Engineering and Data Science. Today we're using this uh, GoToWebinar software, um, which uh, looks something like this. You can expand or contract the panel using the orange icon. You can switch between full screen and windowed by using this one. And there's also a questions dialog box, which you can enter any questions into, and we'll take some time at the end to go through them. So once again, welcome to this webinar. Um, to give you an idea of the agenda today, we're going to give you an introduction to this Segal software for Python and data science. We're going to show you how you can extend Petrel with Python packages like Pandas, NumPy, and Scikit-Learn. We're also going to show you how you can prepare data sets for machine learning using InvestigatorPy. And we're going to have a short workflow presentation <clears throat> on data science machine learning uh, using some GNG data. First of all, how do you get access to the products that we will show today? Well, actually, it's good news. The Python tool is included with every toolbox license that's out there. So whether you have geology, geophysics, reservoir engineering, project management, or the new unconventional toolbox, all of those license can activate a Python tool. Similarly, the investigator Pi is going to be part of the standard blueback investigator. So as of version 5.2, which is coming out in Q1, you can export your investigation with the metadata uh, to Python. However, if you're using an older version, you can still get to the data, at least of your investigation, by the export to spreadsheet function. So first of all, let's set the scene of why we're adding functionality to Link, Petrel, and Python. We see that many of our uh, users, geologists, geophysicists, and engineers, they want to be able to extend their Petrel workflows with good functionality that you find in Python packages like NumPy and Pandas. And they want to be able to write scripts in Petrel and have a bit more flexibility. Petrel itself is also lacking a good scripting language to uh, manipulate objects. So that's another good reason to implement Python. And also, a lot of data is locked up in Petrel projects. So things like seismic data and model properties, they can be fairly cumbersome to try to access directly in Python. So providing a bridge is uh, quite useful. By providing this bridge between uh, Petrel and Python, we can also make use of our data in a rich development environment like Jupyter Notebooks and really extend our scientific workflows. And also, well, Python scripting is fun and it can let you be a bit more creative in your work. So with that, let's jump straight into the first product we want to show today, the Python tool, which is part of the Blueback toolbox. As the name suggests, the Python tool is a plugin that lets you run Python scripts in Petrel against Petrel objects. Essentially, it's an API for interacting with Petrel using Python. And this is the, the value that we're, we're adding here. You can access external Python libraries such as NumPy and SciPy, but this requires that you have a Anaconda installation on the site. You can, of course, run these scripts self-contained using uh, built-in Iron Python, but this will restrict uh, being able to access external libraries. The scripts can be run in the tool or as part of a workflow, meaning they can be integrated into the Petrel workflow editor. How does it work? First of all, you have a, a toolbox installation which contains the Python tool itself. And then you add an Anaconda installation on the side. And with the Anaconda installation, you can install the packages that you require um, to use or that you want to use like NumPy, SciPy. 
And then within Petrel, you'll connect your Python tool to the equivalent Anaconda environment and access all those packages. So for those of you who are familiar with Anaconda, this will be uh, second nature, but basically you just connect the Python tool to an Anaconda environment. So what else can it do? As part of the API, you have access to well logs, seismic models, properties, surfaces, points, and polygons. And that's the supported objects as of today, but we're aiming to add more uh, as time goes by. When you access the data in Petrel, you do so as read-only by default, and the tool also has a helper function to help you create new empty objects when you want to write back your results. Essentially what the tool does, it converts your Petrel objects to either a NumPy array or to Pandas data frame. This works pretty straightforward for the easy objects like well logs and point sets, but for three-dimensional objects, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. In that set case, you need to use uh, what's called chunking, and this is an API to let you break down the three-dimensional objects into more manageable subsets, so you don't get overloaded with data. As we mentioned, the API also supports workflow variables, so that helps you to read and write information in the Petrel workflows. And it also has a Petrel link to help you to read directly from the Python input tree, which helps you uh, select multi-objects. Here we can have a quick look at how it works. In the tool, you select the Petrel object that you want to use from a dropdown, and each object has then its own relevant API. So in this example here, we can see a borehole. You can perform this function logs, which returns all the logs on the borehole. Or you can also use this logs data frame, which will return a data frame of well logs when you give it list. And on the right hand side, you can see what these data frames look like. As we mentioned, for the 3D objects, it's a little bit more complicated. You're required to chunk them or break them down into a more manageable piece. You can do this by grabbing all, a column, a layer, or a chunk, which is a small three-dimensional subset. And then chunks themselves can then be passed to NumPy array or Pandas data frame. So before we go into a demo, just let's summarize what can you do with the Python tool? Well, essentially, if Python can do it, you can do it from the Python tool. So some ex examples of this might be extending the mathematical operations of Petrel by including the NumPy library, for example, some of the linear algebra. You can extend Petrel's workflow editor options, maybe change some functions there and change how data is returned. You can also run algorithms on Petrel objects using external libraries, for example, scikit-learn. Python has a great interface to write to flat files, for example, Excel, so you can really do a tighter integration with Petrel and Excel files. Or you could also trigger external processes, for example, as part of a workflow. So you could use the workflow editor to trigger external um, applications or operations on the operating system level. The Python tool also let, gives you a bit more screen real estate for writing complex equations, maybe with some debugging options. So there's some nice options there for petrophysics and engineering type operations. And you can also link to your machine learning workflows by running externally generated machine learning classifiers. And we'll show a bit of this in the demo. So with that, let's move to Petrel and take a look at the Python tool in action. So here I have my standard Petrel, and I'm going to access the toolbox by clicking on the Segal icon or the Marina icon. And this will open up my Marina, and I'm then going to choose the Python tool. When I want to start working with an object uh, from Petrel in Python, I will add a new row to this table, and then simply choose the object that you want to work with. So we can say a well, and then we'll choose a specific well here. When you do that, you then specify a variable name, and that is how you then access this object in Python. So here we could, for example, let's just say we're going to print var, and var is my well bore here. 
And when you do this, it returns a object of type borehole with a given Petrel name. So in order to understand how we can interact with this object, we can refer to the API help and look at the class reference, domain objects, and then borehole. And in here you can see everything that the object borehole can do, all the properties and functions that are built in. So you can, for example, get the betrayal name, or for example, get all the logs of a borehole. So this is how you understand how you can interact with the objects. Now I'm going to show you a quick example using boreholes. So firstly, I can create a list of global well logs, which I have here, var1, var2, and var3. And using the function logs data frame, I can get all those logs for my well bore called var. So this returns a data frame, which I can then just print out the header of. So if we do like so, then we get returned our uh, pandas data frame. For those of you unfamiliar with a pandas data frame, it's essentially a Excel spreadsheet in code form. So all our data is then represented by columns, which are the properties, and rows, which are the samples. So data frames have an API themselves, which give you a lot of helper functions to work with your data. So we can, for example, describe our data frame, which will return all the descriptive statistics of our data frame or spreadsheet. And we can also print the, the core here, which is the correlation coefficient between each of the axes. So we're only scratching the surface here, but these data frames offer you a lot of functionality for working with the data. So now we're going to move on a bit. We're going to look at how to access an external library in this case, NumPy, and use it to extend Petrel. So firstly, I'm importing NumPy, and then I'm creating a function which takes in some data x and performs a NumPy log and returns uh, a value. I can then run this on my data frame to create a new column, like so. And I can then using another inbuilt function of data frames, I can smooth the result. So by moving up and down the rows, I can smooth. So if we then describe our new data frame like so, you'll see that I have uh, two new columns. Finally, what I want to do is then I want to write my result back to Petrel. So using the Python tool, I've created a new empty object here called sum index. So all I'm required to do is drop the null values and then uh, set the values of some index to the measure depths and my new attribute from the Python tool. So we'll run this script and go back to our well section window. And you'll see that we have our original, original density log and our new sum index attribute, which is a log of density with a little bit of smoothing applied. So this is just to show you that it's so tightly integrated into Petrel that you can have it open on the side of your well section window and perform calculations together and look at the results. And I'm going to take this one step further and use an external Python library to perform clustering for me. So now I'm going to import a clustering library from sklearn. I'm going to prepare the data that I want to cluster by passing in some columns of my data frame and keep track of the measure depths. I then declare my clustering algorithm. So I want to perform a clustering using, uh, let's say, six clusters, and then fit it to my data. And as we did before, all that's required is for us to then set the values of our output log to our uh, classification uh, labels in this case. So we run this. And you'll see that my well log will then be updated to our six classes once it's finished, like so. And I can go back and let's change that back to, to three, maybe run again. And there we have the 
the three clusters. Next, uh, I want to then move on a little bit further and show you two uh, further examples with the Python tool on how we can automate these things. So Python is fantastic because you want to save time and run operations on many objects. So I have a couple of examples of that for working with seismic data. <clears throat> In the Python tool, you can multi-select objects by using this multi-selection tool here. So I could select all my seismic cubes, like so, and add them to the list. And they all get a variable name, which is equal to the, the name. So instead of keeping track of all these names, I can use the API to just perform an operation on each of those seismic cubes in our little tree here. So here I create a loop that says for each item in my Petrel link seismic cubes, print the name, uh, take a chunk at inline 50, cross line 50, get the raw values and print them out. So it's not very exciting, but the point is here that it's automating the operation along uh, these five or so uh, seismic cubes that I have. So you can extend this up to as many um, cubes as you want. The other way to apply Python scripts across many objects is, of course, then to make use of the Petrel workflow editor. So in this case, we're doing the same um, operation, but this time the, op the automation or the looping is performed by Petrel. So here I have a simple workflow and I say, for all icons in the survey one folder of type seismic cube, uh, give it a reference called variable A, and then I perform the very same seismic uh, operation on variable A, which gets some data and prints it out. So in this case, when I run that, the looping or the automation is done by Petrel, but it's executing my own Python script. And we get some output to the Petrel uh, message log in this case. So the point was to show you the two different ways we have to automate tasks uh, in Petrel using the Python tool. We're now going to move on a little bit and show the investigator pie, which performs a slightly different task. So what the investigator pie does is that it really it opens up the content of an investigation and exposes that to Anaconda or Python. Uh, and this is really for harvesting a data set you then want to use in Python. By going through the investigator, you can ensure that data is reasonably clean and consistent and that you maintain information about the data units, measurement types, you sample the data consistently, and you also include relevant spatial information. So as we mentioned, this saves you significant amount of time for data collection, quality control, and feature engineering, which any data scientist will tell you is the most time-consuming part of any machine learning project. And all that's required to work with this is to install a Python package which will read your investigations. The benefits of Investigator Pi is really in the investigator itself. As many of you may know, uh, you can combine many different objects together in your investigation as long as they share the same Petrel template. You can also include the spatial dimensions of objects, including time. And most importantly, you can filter on relevant objects, like, for example, between well tops uh, in zones or along a wellbore. And this is a really powerful feature over trying to do this in uh, standalone in Python with, with last files, for example. The investigator pie can also give you a data loading report, which can tell you if any of your objects are missing data. And you, of course, have your standard visualization options of the investigator for a visual QC of the data before you go to Python. And the investigator also allows you to filter the data um, and take that information over. So it would look something like this. You would build a data set. You can visualize it in the investigator, and you could then filter it using uh, these, these um, filters in the investigator, and then export that to Python. And when you read it into Python, you're then presented with our old friend, the pandas data frame. So it's converting investigations to a pandas data frame, where you get your dimensions, information on the data set, where it came from, you will also be provided the units of the data, and you can customize how the data is then uh, presented. And of course, any relevant filters are applied as well and carried across into Python. As we mentioned, it's possible to customize how the data is presented. So you can, for example, customize the units 
or you can also customize the discrete data to say if you want that as strings or as numerical values. And this is because certain algorithms require you to present discrete data as a code rather than a string. With the investigator pie, you can also bring back information to Portrell. So we could build a uh, classifier or regressor using many of the different machine learning uh, packages. We can then pickle this um, model, bring that back to Portrell where it can predict new data. And we'll show this as part of the demo. So now let's take a quick look at the investigator pie. So I'm going to go to Portrell and I'm going to create a new object and say blueback investigation. I'm then going to add a data set, in this case, well logs. Choose some well logs that I want to include or some wells I want to include. So we'll go for these three here. Uh, I can then select the dimensions that I want. I'm gonna go for a gamma ray, neutron and density. Uh, Multi-select is also a feature of 5.2. You can do like so. We'll add the dimensions. And then we can, of course, filter between our formation tops. And this is a really valuable function over trying to do this in Python. Um, at this point, we can also show the data loading report, which will highlight any problems in our data set. Uh, but today, I think I've got the luck of the draw today, and everything looks OK. So we press OK. And this creates our investigation. We could then visualize this in the standard way, like for example, in our matrix window or in a cross plot, where we can then uh, you know, change the dimensions that we want and also add any relevant filters to our data. So here we can add a freehand filter, for example. Then all you can do is right click and say export to investigator pi. We'll then move over to our uh, Jupyter notebooks where we can then pick up this information. So I'm going to show you now how you load the investigator in Jupyter. You import the investigation package and then read your exported file, which converts your investigation to a pandas data frame, as we mentioned. You can then, of course, get access to the additional metadata included in your investigation, like, for example, the names of each data set, the names of the dimensions, and also the available units of each of the dimensions. We can customize how the data is presented in the data frame. We can change the discrete data to um, codes instead of names. And we could also extract individual data sets from our investigation if you wanted, for example, to keep one well back for a blind test. Uh, finally, of course, we can then filter our data frame based on the visual filter that we created in Investigator. You can see here we had these many samples before. And when we apply the filter, we've got a reduced number of samples in our data frame. So we've excluded the erroneous data. And finally, uh, we can also query the investigation module to see all the different things it can, can do for us. So the investigator should uh, pass over your data and it behaves in the same way as the investigator does in Petrel. And you can then plot your data and interrogate the data in similar ways in Python. The final thing I want to show before we move on to the data science demo is how we can bring back a classifier to portrayal and predict new data. So my colleague uh, Thomas, as part of his demo, has created a model to predict facies. So I can then import this by adding a new Python classification into portrayal. And here I pick up uh, his uh, pickled model, like so. It'll double check with me that I've got the necessary uh, features to predict what I want. And then when I press OK, it will then begin to predict facies based on the input features defined in the, in the model. So once it's completed, we then have a new dimension in our investigation, in this case facies, which we can then 
uh, color by, and you'll see that it's predicted these four different fishes from our input data by using a Python pickled model. So now it's uh, time for me to pass over to my colleague Thomas, who's going to take us through a short data science workflow and show us how he created this uh, facies prediction. Hi, uh, I'm Thomas. I'm going to be giving a very quick demo of a um, hypothetical data science workflow. Um, so I'll be using a Jupyter Notebook in this case. This is, if you have Anaconda already installed, then you can just use a Jupyter Notebook. It's a very common, uh, for data scientists especially, to be familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, I quite enjoy uh, working with them, and because you can break down your code into different cells, you can break down everything line by line. So it makes it quite easy to debug or experiment. So if you're new to uh, Python, or you just want to to just experiment a little bit with some new ideas, and this can be a very good way of dealing with that. You also can have things called markdown cells when you, where you can add images or you can add uh, some notes in quite a nice format so that when you share your notebooks with other people or you want to uh, just keep notes for yourself, then it, it's quite a nice format for building things up. Then at the end, you can compile all your, your code into what you, you need as a script and then pass that into Petrel or wherever. I'm going to be running this as a slideshow. This is another neat little advantage, is that we can run these as slideshows and uh, make a nice little presentation. So workflow is going to include importing some data. I'll have a little look at some statistics and visualizations so you can get to know the data a little bit more, do a bit of exploration. Then we're going to work through a little machine learning problem where we're going to train a machine learning algorithm uh, on our data. And then we'll apply that algorithm to fill in some missing flashes data. So I'm going to import a few libraries now. Uh, Bruce has already shown you a little bit of pandas. This is a tabular format for looking at your data, somewhat an Excel replacement with rows and columns. NumPy is for mathematics and some scientific computing. These two, matplotlib is a plotting library. Uh, based off MATLAB, and so if you're familiar with MATLAB, matplotlib, um, it's fairly easy to pick up. And Seaborn is another one which makes very nice uh, uh, figures and is roughly based off matplotlib as well. Uh, what I'm doing when I'm importing these libraries is giving them a little alias. This is very standard, just to make the code a little shorter. Uh, so if you if you see any other code, then uh, these are the typical aliases that are given. So I'm going to import a set of well logs that Bruce has kindly uh, curated for me in Investigator in Patrol, and he has exported that as a CSV. This is, uh, as Bruce has already alluded to, this is a really, really good way of preparing your data. So you can quickly cobble together different well logs or whatever data sets you like, do some filters and merge everything neatly. And this, even if you're familiar with, with Python, can be a bit of a, uh, a pain to do and takes up a little bit of time to make sure it's done properly, but investigator does that for you. So I'm going to take PD, this is pandas, the alias that we've given it, and we're going to run the method read CSV. Because Python is intended to be very intuitive to use, most of the language is, you know, most of the code, it reads like normal language. So I'm going to read a CSV file, and that CSV file is called well.csv, and I'm going to save this as an object. Uh, well, so I'll just run that quickly. Now we've imported our data. Let's explore that a little bit with pandas. Pandas. As we said before, pandas comes with a lot of simple methods to explore your data, and I'll give you a demonstration of a few commonly used methods. So we could type in. I'll just change this to say head. Bruce showed you head before, and this provides the top five rows of your data frame. I could similarly type in ten here and get the top ten. Or if we uh, wanted to see the bottom 10 uh, samples in, uh, or rows in our data, then we could just do this. You could also take a slice through your data frame using iLock. And here we're looking at the 100th to 105th uh, row, or we could look at these 15 rows. You can quickly navigate. And th this uh, becomes particularly handy when you have very large data sets. Imagine if you had 400,000 rows of data, then trawling through an Excel file would be. 
cumbersome at, to say the least. So this, uh, this is a very neat package for looking through your data. Next, we can use the method info, and this gives a very quick breakdown of what your, your data is and what it contains. We can see things like the number of uh, rows we have, the number of entries. We get information about the data types. So we have floats, integers, objects, this is text, for example, or something like Boolean, so true or false. And it gives you an idea of the memory usage. So very quickly, we can get a, a good idea of what our data set contains or, or uh, the data types, for example. And this can be very useful if you need to change data types for, for some reason. Now we can also do value counts. And as it's quite intuitive, this is going to count the number of values for our column data set, which is the, the name, different names of wells. And we're going to save this as a data frame called sample count. And then we're going to show that. So we create a little data frame here, which tells us the number of samples we have per well. So that's nice and neat and easy to use. We can then use that data frame later on. Similarly, we could count the number of fascies by using value counts on the column fascies. Again, we'll save that to a data frame and we'll call this fascies count. And what we can see here, we have some shales, carbonate, sands, shale sand, but oh dear, here we have over a thousand of our samples that are classified as unidentified fascies. So here we don't know whether, whether they're shale or sand or carbonate, for example. And the, here lies our problem. We could also quickly take a little bit more uh, information by doing counts for uh, fascies by well. So here for each well, we can see the, the counts of different uh, fascies. And it's really just these two wells where we, have, we don't have any uh, fascies classifications. We can also uh, use the method called describe. I'll just get rid of that out of it. Save it as something called stats. We have already showed you this, but you get uh, uh, mean, max, and you get uh, into quartile ranges of your data for each column. Now, I don't like the standard look of this, so I'm going to just do transpose. Again, showing that Python is a nice intuitive language to use. We can transpose the data. I'm still not so keen on the number of decimal places, so then we can just call round the decimal place two. Oops, what have I done? Yeah, missed the dot there. There we go. So here we have uh, a reform data frame giving us a better idea of our statistics. And again, you can say this is a CSV file or an Excel file. We'll just call it up later. Now let's get to know our data a little bit more using some uh, visualizations. I've made a little uh, function here. Don't worry too many about, much about the details. The idea is that you can write a little function, idea, a little program, where we're going to take all of that uh, data set information and we, for each column, we're going to produce a, a well log curve figure. So just run this function, that's saved, and then I can recall this function that I've just made called plot many log. And I'm going to take in my well data set, that data frame, but I'm going to say I'm only going to look at this one well name under the, the column data set. Let's see. Here we get a, a new figure per well curve that we have in our data set. And here we can see, you know, we've got quite a few changes in gamma ray, for example, and density. Unnamed is actually just a copy of the index, which is the depth. So that's just a straight line down. Data set, of course, is the same all the way through. So that's just a straight line. See some changes in fascias with depth. And so we get a quick overview, a graphical overview of how our um, different columns vary with that. Now, as you can see, some of those columns are probably not very useful. So I'm just going to remove that unnamed DC versus GR and data sets. Check the data frame again, and then we see uh, the head. So to drop columns, we just passed in the method drop. Again, quite intuitive and we just tell it that axis equals one. This is just telling that we're dropping columns, not rows. I can also use Seaborn. This is another plotting library using the alias SNS, and we'll do a pair plot. And this is gonna return a couple of little figures where we can see uh, scatter graphs and diagonally uh, kernel densities of the different fascias. So we've colored each by five fascias. 
You can see that in the kernel identities, most of these different bashes are quite clearly separated under different, whether it's GR or uh, gamma ray or density, and our undefined uh, data is covering pretty much the full spectrum of, of data that we have uh, in, in terms of fashies for uh, where we know the fashies. So this uh, will lend itself quite well to machine learning. It's a pretty clean data set. Uh, so we have a rather ideal situation here. So it's time for us to tackle some machine learning. We'll be using the uh, package called scikit-learn. And this comes with a lot of different classification algorithms and regression algorithms. So first of all, we want to frame our problem. We had over a thousand rows of data where fascist was undefined. And if we were to, for example, want to use these well logs in an Odyssey uh, uh, project or for many other reasons, that we would actually want to know as much as we could about all of our samples, including the, the fascists. So by definition, this is a classification problem. We want to classify different fascists. And uh, a good algorithm to use is random forest. I'm saying this is a good out of the box model. It works quite well in a lot of different situations. And if you're not familiar with the random forest, essentially what it creates is many, many decision trees that find interrelationships in your data. And it averages out those decision trees and usually produces a fairly good result. Um, so that's the algorithm we're gonna to choose to test in this demo. Now, what I'm going to do is split my data up a little bit here. First of all, I'm going to create a training data set. This is what I'll use to uh, teach my algorithm the relationships between fascies and the other well logs. So I'm going to basically create a new data frame called well train. I take my original data of well and only keep this, the rows where the fascies is not, this uh, exclamation mark from equals means not, where it doesn't equal undefined. So I have all the, the rows where I know what the fascists are. Then I'm going to hold back some data, create a new data frame called well apply, and this is going to be all the data where I don't know what the fascists are. Now this uh, training data, I'm going to end up splitting up uh, again for my machine learning algorithm. Most algorithms require that the data is processed uh, in a specific way. So things like fascies as uh, discrete values need to be converted to numerical values. So that would be called uh, label encoding or one-hot encoding. Also need to scale the data between zero and one, uh, or you can scale it between minus one and one or, or whatever you need for your algorithm. And then we're gonna take that training data set that where we know the fascies, and I'm gonna split that down again into train and test data sets. So, First of all, I'm going to have a, my algorithm is going to receive a data set where it knows the fascies and it's going to know the gamma ray on all the other world curves. It will learn the interrelationships between those uh, different columns in our data set. And then I'll hold out a little bit of that data where we do know the fascies. It will only see uh, gamma ray and density in the other columns, but not know fascies, and it will make a prediction based on the relationships that it's learned. I can then test how well that model is working and retain a score. So now I'm just going to do a bit of that pre-processing, encoding, scaling, and uh, splitting. So again, this is a bare block of code. So if you're familiar with these things, uh, you can have a quick look at what's going on. But don't worry too much. This is just a bit of data preparation that we need to do. Oops, I need to actually uh, run this. So then that runs fine there. I'm going to take from sklearn, I'm going to import my random forest classifier, and I'm going to call it model. With each of these algorithms, we can pass in quite a few different parameters. In this case, I just passed in two parameters that I wanted to define. I put in the number of estimators. This is the number of decision trees to be created in my forest as 100. Um, generally, the more uh, estimators you have the better, although this does come with a, a time cost and a computational cost. A random state is just a placeholder so that we're keeping the same data each time so that I can keep track uh, of the, the model that I am doing the same thing each time. Uh, you may want to shuffle your data if you're doing this in a more uh, uh, proper project. 
So now we call our model and we use the method fit and we pass in our well curves like uh, gamma ray and density and we tell it what the fascias are so our model can learn. This for the moment points out a whole bunch of parameters. Could spend quite a bit of time looking at all the different parameter tuning, uh, but generally the, the standard parameters work quite well in a lot of situations. So I'm just going to not going to play anymore with uh, parameters. Then we can uh, test our model, see how well it's learned those interrelationships with our uh, little test data, and then point out a score. Well, we get a really excellent score of 0.989. The best score you could possibly get would be one. So it's not often that you'll get a, a situation where you get such a good score as this, but then again, we have um, uh, a really clean, uh, neat data set to be working with. So I'm gonna say, at least for now, with, without too much critical thought, that I'm extremely happy with this uh, model, and now it's ready for uh, further deployment. We can import a package called Pickle, what this does is it serializes your model uh, parameters and the, the, uh, the coefficients that relate to those interrelationships, and it saves it as a file. You can then pick up this file, I'm gonna call it loaded model, and then I'm gonna check that it's still working, producing the same results I had before. And we get 0.989, we know it's working, we could then uh, pick this up in Patrol as Bruce has already showed you. So one final thing, I'm gonna go back to that well apply. This is where I don't know what any of the crashes are. They were all as undefined. I'm gonna do a bit of that pre-processing that I needed to do before. And then I'm going to print out those results as a new column in the data frame. So you can see we originally had fascias that were always undefined. And here we got uh, predicted fascias being carbonate. So I could maybe just uh, take the top 20 and see if we have a bit more variation. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm doing something here that I shouldn't be doing. <laughs> anyway, um, now we can go back and uh, plot. I just need to run this one line of code for my uh, training data. Now we can just make a quick figure to get a scatter plot. Here I have my predicted fascies on my data set where I did not know what the fascies were, they were all undefined. And here I have my original data set where I knew the fascies. Generally, you've got sands in the right place, in the right, uh, as well as uh, shaley sands and carbonates. Maybe not predicting shale so well here, but um, it looks fairly good. So I'll say for now that we're fairly happy with our, our modeling. So in summary, we imported our well log data that come from uh, an investigation in Patrol. We explored our data a little bit using pandas and some uh, custom visualizations. We trained a machine learning algorithm which performed pretty well, and then we're able to apply that model successfully, predict the fascies, and we could do that both in the notebook and in the trial. So uh, thank you for listening. Yep, thanks, Thomas. So now we're just going to have a couple of closing remarks before we open up for questions. Um, so finally, uh, uh, just to recap, we showed today the Python tool, which is really there to run Python scripts inside of Portrell, and the investigator Pi, which is there to help you harvest a clean data set for taking over to Python for data science and machine learning. Um, if you want to get, if you're going to get started with either of the tools, please forward any questions to support.geo at sagal.com. Don't forget the geo. Uh, and please contact us for a more specific demo on Python investigator Pi if you'd like to see anything further. And we also have consultants available for projects and uh, a small training course that we've developed called Python for Joel's Geophysics and Reservoir Engineering. So uh, with that, I'll just wish you a happy programming. And now I will open up for any uh, questions, which you can enter into the questions pane on the, on the side here. Um, let's see, do we have any examples of Python script we've created for Portrayal on GitHub? Um, not at the moment, but that's something we want to provide, or at least a portrayal project with some examples in it. What debugging options, tools are there available? Um, well, we showed the Python tool. Uh, you'll see that it has a very simple script editor. Um, so you really want to combine uh, your use of Python with Jupyter Notebooks on the side. So you probably use Jupyter to 
develop and explore your algorithm. And then once you're pretty happy with it, bring it into the Python tool um, for using there. Is it possible to loop over a collection of wells by choosing a folder? Yes, you can do that using the Petrel workflow editor, or you could just multi-select the wells into uh, the Python tool as we showed. What kind of features do you have for reservoir engineers? Um, well, I think uh, the, a lot of the Python numerical packages would be of interest to reservoir engineers, and there's a lot of other packages out there. Uh, finally, uh, will there be a recording available? Yes, we've made uh, a recording and we'll post that to everyone who signed up. What is the difference between this tool and the workflow editor? Well, the workflow editor has predefined functions and operations which you can perform, but you cannot change what they do. With the Python script, you can create a script that will do whatever you want it to. So I think there are significant differences there between Python and the workflow editor. How did we re-import the new fascies in Petrel? Um, we showed the example a little bit backwards. So Thomas prepared a machine learning model, which he then pickled. And I then picked up the pickle from, uh, from Python and added it to the investigator. What kind of Petrel objects can be reached from the Python script? Uh, so we answered that in the beginning. It's well logs, models, Seismic, 2D and 3D, model properties, surfaces, point sets, and polygons. Uh, can we share the Jupyter Notebook with the presentation? Yeah, we can probably do that uh, with some uh, CSV file inside. Uh, question here, what can you do on Seismic? Uh, I missed more tests on Seismic. What can you do with Seismic? Uh, well, we just showed a very basic example with Seismic, but for example, in NumPy, you have Fourier transforms and other frequency manipulations, which come in handy with, um, with Seismic. Uh, do we support fracture data in brackets point data? We support uh, point sets in Petrel. And I think that's all the questions that we've had. We can give it a minute or two to, uh, yeah, okay. Is it possible to install a local Python library in the Petrel plugin? So if you can install it to your Anaconda environment, then you can access it from the, the Python tool. Okay, so I think that was all the questions. So there's nothing more to say, but thanks for joining. And please contact us if you have any further questions. Thanks.